So the idea behind this session really is just to give some of the thought processes that are going through um, as we build up our, our residual appraisals in the build to rent sector. Obviously, Ryan touched on it a little bit from a planning perspective this morning. Um, but what we're going to try and do is keep this as light, hopefully, and as live um, as we can, and then deal with any questions that you have at the end. So um, if I may just start with, uh, with some introductions, Erin. Uh, I'm Erin Clark, I'm at Investec Bank. We do senior debt and um, equity sometimes. So we're sector agnostic other than hotels, aren't we? Mm. Uh, and we'll do uh, yeah, senior debt pieces up to sort of seventy percent of cost up and down the country. Uh, Johnny, <clears throat> I'm Johnny Caddick. I'm the founder and managing director of Moda Living. Uh, we've got about two thousand units on site now in, in Edinburgh, Leeds, Birmingham. Um, where else are we? Uh, Manchester, and Liverpool. Uh, we've got a pipeline of about seven and a half thousand units across the UK, down to Brighton, and more latterly coming into London. Good afternoon. I'm Alex Green. I'm a director within the Living Capital Markets team at JLL, um, and my role is to provide development and investment advice to investors and developers within the BTR sector. Yeah, thank you. Jack, can we uh, get the template up, please? Hopefully this works, otherwise this is going to be a very quick session. <laughs> right, so just, just to add some context, there's some elements to this which we're just going to have to ask you to take as read. So, so what we're envisaging here is a scheme out in the regions of the UK approximately 350 units, so we've got some scale. Um, it's car park free, uh, so no cars, so we're not gonna complicate that. Um, the site has planning, um, and again, there's some complexity around obviously the vagaries of the planning system, again, as touched on earlier, and what that might ultimately do when appraising the site and the risk that's built into that. The idea is that it's the developer's desire to hold and operate the asset upon completion. Um, and again, we'll touch with with Erin shortly in terms of the debt piece and how that's actually working in in the market at the moment. Um, and um, uh, there's no directly comparable BTR products in the vicinity. So that's really where we're starting this 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 piece from. So I guess the major thing in terms of building up the residual is what's the actual gross development value when the thing is finished. And there's been a lot of talk historically about the reference to aggregate vacant possession value. Um, but in this instance, what we're seeing in the market now quite consistently is actually investors starting really what they're trying to develop, which is obviously a rental product. So how do we look at our rents? That's the major driver here. So um, Johnny, I guess, uh, obviously with Moda, you're producing a really top quality product. And frankly, and as in this instance, you've got a situation where there's no real comparables out there that are um, directly relevant to the sort of products and the service that you're you're bringing through. So how how do you how do you approach the sort of rental side of things? Um, well, it's a it's a challenge, to be honest, uh, Simon. I mean, if you look across the UK, we we started developing uh, in the regions um, looking at BTR about 2013, and the problem is after the crash, um, 2019. So 2009, there's been no new product built. So it's trying to find a similar product of a similar type that you can actually draw that comparable off. And it, it's been very tricky. Um, you go to the cities and they've started going. Manchester was the easiest place to start with because there's been a lot of for sale stock, uh, obviously traditionally sold to buy to let investors in China. So we were starting to look at that. But really, when you delve behind the marketplace, you're looking at the growth of those regional cities. We're starting to see a lot of employment growth in these regional cities. Uh, there's an urbanization pull, so you can start seeing that. And then we look at the affordability as well. So uh, who are those employers? Uh, what type of dispensable, uh, disposable income of the, uh, of the people who work in these cities got? And we work back from there on our affordable basis. And we kind of look at about 30% of the uh, take-home income uh, as a bit of a barometer in London. And our regional schemes, that can go slightly higher and a bit of flex. Yeah. Um, and then we look at those uh, the demand and supply dynamics in those cities. Um, and there's a lot of pent up demand. Um, a lot of your stats support these figures as well. So it's not an exact science, as we all know. Yeah. Um, but we do we do a lot of research. And obviously, we've done some research in terms of trying to hook um, a, a number in terms of build to rent premium, multifamily premium. What's what's your general view on sort of if you're benchmarking against not so comparable product? How how do you build in? 
uh, I guess, that premium from your perspective? Um, again, it's a huge challenge because uh, it's like serviced offices in many ways because you're providing those extra services. So in our, on our schemes, you've got free gyms, you've got workspace, you've got free internet. And I think that's one of the challenges when you're marketing a scheme to the customer, trying to explain all these benefits. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're phased opening in Manchester already, and we're seeing a 10% premium in Manchester. Okay. So that's our figure at the moment, but we're not fully open, and we hope to improve on that premium yeah. once the scheme and all the facilities are available. Okay. And Erin, I guess from a, a banker's perspective, are, are you already buying into this premium that we're starting to see evidence of in the market, or is it still a little bit early days, or is it a case of judge each scheme on its merits? Or do both. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, particularly when we're talking about so in this example where there's no um, comparable products around. So you then have to sort of reach out further to sort of other cities and, and other kind of things and comps. So for us, we will always use the sort of regular um, sort of rental product that's available as our starting point. Yeah. And then trying to understand what people will pay extra for all the other services. So yeah. that's that's a real challenge for us and it becomes a really difficult thing to try and understand especially as we've been sort of there's been less well there's more now obviously but as there's not been huge amounts of sort of finished right. products yeah. um, to okay. be able to get an so, so what we're getting a sense of already is that there's quite a variance in terms of what would be an appropriate rental tone to actually account for the level of service and the quality of these sorts of new buildings of which there's very little evidence and valuers have little to rely upon, which ultimately is where the valuation starts and falls. So, Jack, if we can just pop in some some base rents that we can we can build from, um, again reflecting the sort of regional nature of the scheme. Um, and basically, what we're going to try and do is build this up so at the end we do actually have a we do have a result for you. Um, so bear with us just whilst we're we're doing this. But these we would say are, are broadly in in context of. Um, uh, the, the sort of base rents that we see in the region. Um, we're going to come back to affordable, and, and Alex is going to, uh, to, to to take us through the impact of, of the affordable elements. It's just the way that the system's uh, brought up. I think then moving on to growth. Now, rental growth is um, is something that we get challenged with quite a bit. I mean, Aaron, starting with you this time, in terms of banks' views on residual appraisals, because ultimately your security in, in these things is all about the land and then the construction cost that flows through as a funder of these sorts of developments. What, what, what's your view in terms of the way that growth is, is built into your appraisals? I think taking a, a, a the, I mean, I think the, sort of the short answer is it's somewhere in the middle, but what we've found is that if, if we, on the worst case scenario, once we're sort of taking up construction risk, so assuming that we've got a, a, something that's built and trading, um, we will usually look to discount a lot of the Rental growth that gets assumed. Okay. Uh, and I know often with the valuations that we look at, if you are going to assume the growth coming in, that might it sort of cut back to a, a, the yield softening a little bit. Okay. So we struggle, although knowing if you've got a two year build, it's it, the right answer is not to sort of discount all of it. So yeah. Okay. So that's probably music to, to Johnny's ears in terms <laughs> of the challenges around. Yeah. I cost inflation and, and how they how they actually work in reality. So there's, there's two aspects for me. I think because residential has been approached in a certain way historically, and you compare it to other asset classes, so commercial property, if you want to build a new office block in a city centre, the first one that's been built in 10 years, you've got to assume that it's going to be worth, the, rent, the rental tone's going to be worth more than the one next door that's been built 10 years old and it's brand new stock. So you've got to allow some form of growth in those from a starting stock. And the second one is the look back at a breakup value as well, which frustrates me quite a lot because you don't do that in other asset classes. If I'm building a shopping centre, yeah. the value doesn't look back and go, well, there's uh, you know, 50 shops there, let's value them individually because you could break it up. You could do that with most asset classes. Yeah. So I think the, it has to come on. And we, we design a lot of our, well, our, all our schemes specifically for rent. So yeah. it's, um, there is a slight frustration there, and it will change. In yeah. And I think that's something we're definitely sensing across the market. Um, there is, has been that massive seismic shift around appraising the income first. Some investors obviously looking back at, at that aggregate vacant possession value. I know, Erin, we've touched on that. And that's certainly something you do to, to underwrite schemes. Well, well. I'd say in, in, the, in the sort of few years that we've been sort of looking at, sort of when we first started looking at these kind of schemes and to now sort of funding them, that breakup value was certainly something, a, a, a really strong metric that we would use going into our doing our underwriting. 
it's it's usually something that we will run now anyway, but I think it's less, there's much less focus on it. So there's no. this, this real shift to commercializing in yeah. multifamily income streams. I think the, in, in terms of, again, from the, you know, our, our main priority is what happens on the exit. Yeah. And I think now there's so much more confidence that there is exit by sort of the institutional market yeah. as opposed to just having... So this is very much a confidence in the sector as it Absolutely. grows and you've got these transactional evidence coming through, real real key driver from the bank's point of yeah, view. Definitely. Great stuff. Um, so I guess we'll accept that there should be some growth here. Um, it, it's, it's, it's well supported out there. I guess then moving to how we generate a net operating income, I have to look at these management costs. So um, Johnny, obviously right in the thick of this now with mm -hmm. Angel Gardens and yeah. um, I guess there's historically been a, a, a view that 25% is the absolute number that should go into all of these appraisals. LLs view. <laughs> so um, I, you're leading the witness. Now. <laughs> um, in, in terms of what you're sort of seeing on the ground with some of the schemes that you, you will, and historically the schemes you've operated, yeah. is that the right approach? Um, from our perspective, we're not fully open with Angel Garden, so we're not in a position to fully analyze that. But I think when we do the analysis, um, we do it on a very granular basis, very detailed basis. and I think what we tend to look at is each scheme is different. So some schemes have multiple cores, uh, there's different nuances with schemes, different forms of amenities, add extra management costs in. And what we don't do in our appraisal terms, um, again, going back to commercial properties, normally you have a commercialization strip on the ground on the bottom of the line of the appraisal. Yeah. And we haven't added that back in yet. And that's something which will actually offset against the, the operation operational costs if you want to do that. So yeah. There's nuances at the moment. We do a lot of detail, but at the moment it's, it's assumptions. And I think it will come out in the wash over the next few years as we move into more operational side of, uh, of the BTR market in general. Okay. So so much more like the old service charges are, are driven on a rate per square foot. I mean, is that something you're seeing from a valuation perspective, Erin, in terms of things that you've been involved with to date? Or is it literally a, a fixed allocation as there isn't the transparency in the market well, yet? Again, I, I, and this is the sort of the challenge for lenders who don't sort of do a hoods up on, on that kind of... Sort of those sort of lines to offering. So in terms of when you're looking at sort of scale and, and, and where you can sort of, sort of drive those, depending on the number of units, um, you know, that I think there's quite a lot of sort of elements of that that you can, you can really understand in terms of the sort of outgoings and things like that. But we, um, I think we find it quite challenging and we would probably always err on a more conservative side. Yeah. And again, if we had to get in and run it ourselves, what's the sort of worst case for us? So additional you know, fee lines in terms of third parties as opposed to an owner operator and how they might look at <clears> big again key differentiator in terms of of how that growth to net actually actually works in practice. So I think we're going to adopt a 22.5% uh, growth to net in this particular instance, reflecting the efficiency that uh, that the motor team could bring in yeah. such a situation uh, rather than a stock 25. But I think again, when we look at our multi-family colleagues and um, my contemporaries over in the States, they with, with the transparency that they've got in the market, it's a much more granular breakdown. But for simplistic purposes, um, let's just, just run with this at the moment. No, sorry, can I just add one more thing? I think from, a, from and I know we'll come on to some stuff later, but in terms of a, sort of when a lender's going to look at this, in terms of you know developers having track records uh, and whether you've got an integrated sort of operational business or not, I think that also will sort of tend to let you be more or less, um, sort of, or more or less conservative on that kind of point. So, you know, you've got mm. four or five schemes up and running, uh, and you've got all the track record and experience to show that you really know how to price that sort of budget. Yeah. So it's this confidence and look through in yeah. terms of precedent, really, that we're we're really looking for. Yeah, I think we we've seen that as well. So we we co-invest in the schemes going forward. So we're very much aligned with our our funders, um, Apache Capital, and our the pension fund backers that come into them. So. We're kind of standing on for what we believe, so it gives hopefully our lenders that we work with the confidence that we're actually, you know, we're we're, we're living and breathing aligned interest. We're aligned, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, great. And in terms of cap rates, again, with very little transactional activity out there, it's it's quite hard for the market to actually determine uh, where these where these things should, should really sit. So we're not going to gloss, we're sort of gloss over this point a little bit. So I think in this instance, we're generally seeing uh, sort of. Uh, the cap rates fall in between sort of three and a half and five percent um, from central London over to uh, and this is very much on a built to rent perspective, multifamily perspective. Um, so in this instance, we're going to adopt a four a four four twenty five cap. Um, moving then on to purchases costs, Erin, um, do you want to, in terms of, 
I suppose valuers have historically adopted a full stamp duty allocation, whereas a lot of these trades are being done at a corporate level. How do you how do you tend to assess that? So we'll always use what the sort of the red book definition is, and I don't. Um, and I, and I think in a lot of appraisals that when either these are going to be traded in a in a portfolio, so at a corporate level, or they'll sort of be traded by like an, an SBA rather than an asset sale. Um, you know the difference of that is sort of between what 1.8 and 6.8 sort of purchases cost. So yeah. we'll always, again, go on the basis of having an asset sale because if that was us having to sell it, that's how we would do it. So, yeah. um, again, yeah, I think there's going to be quite a lot of movement on that, but our lender will, will always take so it. The concern that has value is being pushed. So, again, probably a nuance that, Johnny, you find frustrating mm. when you know that actually the reality of it would be it would be a, um, a corporate disposal should, yeah. should you go that way. And so, different lenders take different approaches. Yeah, so well. just making the appraisal that much harder by applying a rate that you wouldn't necessarily adopt in reality. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of inflation, again, as a contracting party as well, I mean, how are you seeing seeing that in the market at the moment? Are you seeing some suppression in terms of build costs? It or? changes, uh, yeah, to okay. be honest, every year. We have a, we have a contracting arm, and uh, so we get a lot of live updates and live feedback from that. What we tend to do, because one of the challenges with Moda is geographically we're building from Edinburgh down to Brighton. So what we tend to do is work with a lot of the same subcontractors, and we get a lot of certainty from those subcontractors in that supply chain. So we get economies of scale, and then we tend to go into an area, procure as much as we can do of the, uh, of the package, and then interview the contractors, find the right contractor that's not necessarily tier one anymore, as it used yeah. to be. So the so without wishing to rub salt in the wounds, you've obviously had real live experience of that yeah. with with Carillion, we had a, we had a, Angel Gardens. So. We had a Carillion, yeah, it was yeah. great. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we had that as a live matter, and I think that's sent shockwaves through the marketplace, and you see what's happened to Kia's share price, and, and so on and so forth. So we, I mean, what we've done is we what we always do historically is look at the team that's there in place. You know, you want the best team in the location. Um, and it's down to the individuals and obviously the covenant strength. What we're finding is that a lot of the tier two contractors uh, are really quite dynamic in this space now, and they're really looking at build to rent. When we first started in Manchester, there was only one contractor that could build Angel Gardens, right. and it was Carillion, yep. uh, because residential was a new asset class uh, for the city back in you know, 2014 when we started working with them. So now there's more contractors that are gearing up for build to rent as they see it as a sustainable. Contractors like build to rent because it's not got the risks of market sales, so yep. all of a sudden you've got you know, something happens in the world and those uh, purchases disappear. You saw it in the last cycle where building stopped. So it's uh, it's flavor of the month with contractors um, and they see a lot of growth in it. So we're seeing a lot of these tier twos coming out now. So developers have a lot more options. And, that, and that's across the country, a deeper pool of contractors that you can go and engage with. Yeah. So what a contractor wants to know is that they've got certainty throughout the project. Yep. Um, and I think now they're understanding where build to rent can come in and give them you know, consistency of work coming throughout. Yeah. So, yeah. And I guess, Aaron, again, from the bank's point of view, in terms of the sort of movement away from tier one, which was always the only way sometimes these things got funded, much more flexible, adopting a similar approach to Johnny? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think depending on the sort of the size of the, 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 the project, um, um, I think there's always an understanding that, um, you know, you may not always get the best value from the sort of tier one contractors, and it's not always appropriate to put them on a sort of a much smaller project. I suppose from the bank's point of view, it's been interesting how much more diligence we'll do on the contractors looking at the sort of payment terms and trying to make sure we understand um, those kind of, you know, what their sort of payment terms are with for them and also with their subbies to make sure our sort of facility is going to sort of cover for that right. well. Uh, and also looking at their sort of financials and what percentage of sort of this project will be as their whole turnover. So it's, it, there's quite a lot more work that will go on to into looking at the contractor yep. as well okay. as the developer. That's, that's I think there's, there's another part as well. You can actually put insurance policies, so performance bonds in place and different instruments to give you some downside protection as well. But uh, yeah. interrogating, and these days, what is a tier one? What's a tier two? You know, it could be yeah. based on turnover, net asset base. So they say something we look at in the same same light. Yeah, and I guess that leads quite nicely into the sort of next element of this around contingency and the risk profile within it. So, again, from a bank's point of view, you're looking for developers to incorporate a bigger contingency with perhaps a lower tier contractor or less experienced contractor. How do you tend to to look through that? I want percent at least of all the projects, regardless of the contractor. Um, I think we're, again, we're, if it's the sort of more experienced um, contractor, and certainly if the developer and the contractor have worked together before, 
it will mean people might be more likely to take a view on having a sort of a, a, a thinner contingency than than five percent. But I think you, you know, there's not very many circumstances I've seen of buildings where you haven't dipped into it at some point. So. Okay, so a five percenter in here is a is a must have. And has that been your experience, Johnny? As we sort of um, move into what's going on in the broader debt market? Yeah, five uh, percent is where we're at. I mean, we uh, we tried to get so much repetition as well. So we you know we. Uh, every scheme we we design, <clears throat> we go over, we critique, and we try and improve on. But you don't want to change anything once you set that contractor in place. You don't want to change anything on the scheme. And I think that's where people who've been unpicking projects as they go through, that's where you get caught out. Yeah. In our okay. So then moving into um, the, the finance piece, um, I mean, generally, appetite for debt in this sector improving, Johnny? Obviously, when, when you first set out on this journey with Moda, uh, yep. Very much a new asset class in the in the yeah. UK. Uh, how, how have you seen that change? Obviously, done some some pretty large fundings over over yeah. recent months. So. Um, it, it, I mean, 2014, end of 2014, we started first started talking to debt providers. There was probably only about three people uh, who wanted to do development finance, unless you wanted to take very long term debt. There were some US uh, banks in place, uh, and we've seen it improve year on year as people understand the product and the asset class and the weight of capital coming in. So. Um, I'd say at the moment from what we're seeing, there's, there is a lot. It's just the understanding of the uh, appraisals and it's understanding of uh, and, and proof, proof of, uh, of, of concept, really, which is what we're, we're seeing every, every year you come to one of these conferences and, and things are becoming more and more established. And yeah. the next bit is when somebody sells a portfolio and then we actually know where that takeout value is. Yeah. So I think banks are getting more and more comfortable with it. We're just looking at Different banks will take different views on loan to values as well, which is yeah. one of the, the challenges. And if you're trying to get your return on your equity, you've got to improve your leverage. Again, yeah. uh, certain banks are in those spaces. I think one of the other challenges is geographically where we're looking, where we do our schemes outside of London. So Liverpool's a good example. You know, that's a, it's a big project for us. That's a 94 million pound project. Yeah. Uh, so you know, when you're taking debt of that scale on a residential project in Liverpool, you know, historically there's been some issues with that. So. Um, we've been trying to break ground with certain areas, but I think you know, as proof of concept, it just gets easier. Yeah. And Aaron, are you seeing more coming to the market, or from 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 your perspective? Yeah, it definitely. I think it, it's it's and again, when we've started looking at um, some of these schemes, when you think about doing a fifty million quid loan in Liverpool, for example, it makes people very very twitchy. Um, and I think. A lot of credit boards have got sort of people that have been around for sort of you know, one or two or three sort of cycles and yeah. have got very long memories um, about losing money, certainly sort of in the region. So I think that that kind of uh, longevity of memory and sort of tending makes people really nervous. Um, and then I think in terms of yeah, there are. I mean, we, we're finding it hugely competitive uh, in the space at the minute. So I think you can have. Debt for all sorts of different sort of packages. So it yeah. just depends on. I think the, the valuation point is, has been typically quite challenging because I think that will guide a lot of loan sizing. Whereas in some of the sort of more um, sectors that are sort of trading a little bit more, so student, for example, that will sort of always do that at cost, knowing that the sort of the end value will be conservative and there's sort of quite a lot of headroom. Whereas I think there's still the sort of the, the cost and value gap. Uh, obviously, the delta in this sector is still narrow. Yeah, it's also yeah, speed, speed as well, which, for as a developer's perspective, is really important. So, as you're bringing your build cost in and you're trying to mail those subcontractor packages and your debt, you've got to bring it in. And sometimes quicker lenders can be attractive yeah. as you're trying to get that, that build price certainty. So, it's paying more for speed. We, there is a slight premium that you'd be yeah. willing to pay for speed and certainty yeah. of it coming in at that date so you can nail those packages absolutely yeah, yeah. and I guess uh, from from our experience working with a number of other developers that perhaps don't have the build to hold model and are just purely looking to, to put products into the market this is where a lot of the the big uh, mainstream institutions so the gray stars the mngs the lngs are actually prepared to do a hundred percent funding which um, and, and at the prevailing rate of the uh, capitalization rate that's being applied. So obviously in terms of sort of balancing out the cost of these developments, that can be beneficial in terms of the approach to the appraisal. And I suspect is where you find in some instances they're really hard to compete. So I guess then moving on to the, 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 real, um, the real bug in terms of the uh, appraisal is actually what level of profit. And I, I think when I hear, if I put my old developer hat on, 
hearing profit cited the whole time isn't actually right. It is a risk and profit allowance. And I think a lot of people do tend to forget the challenges of development. And I know, Johnny, you can speak firsthand on the challenges of development and what that buffer is there. It, it's, a, it's a means to protect the developer, but also to remunerate. And um, I mean, ultimately, as, again, not wishing to rub salt on the wounds from, from uh, Carillion experience, but obviously stepping back in, the delays, that then erodes into that profit level. Yeah, you can change it to cost over and guarantee pot. Which well, there we go. A lot there we go. Said like a true <laughs> developer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Erin, I suppose from a, um, a banking perspective, um, we, we're tending to see, I suppose, profit on cost rates with, with the institutions, a level of sort of seven and a half, 12 and a half is sort of broadly where they want to be, um, depending obviously on the, on the counterparties involved. Is that very much what you expect to see as well? Or Yeah, I mean, we want to know that there's some profit in the scheme. Otherwise, why are we giving it all? And for the same reason, work. ultimately, the protection yeah. for the bank's exposure. And I think, yeah, I think at the end, you know, if that, that sadly will be the first sort of bit to go. So we want to know that there's some sort of headroom yeah. in the debt. But equally, otherwise, you want to know that your clients sort of pay the right amount of money for the loan and they're going to sort of spend the right amount of money on the project. Yeah, okay. So that then throws out uh, residual land value. So all quite simple. So Jack, just cut into the chase there. We've actually got a nice positive uh, residual land value. So um, all the dynamics that sit within it seem to work. So we're home and dry, nice and easy, <laughs> until I've forgotten to ask Alex about the impact of affordable housing. Yeah. So Alex, do you want to just sweep back up and just sort of see, I suppose, what you've been experiencing in terms of negotiations with, with local authorities and how that's determined? Obviously, we've already highlighted there's a huge amount of flex in terms of how different developers, investors are looking at these sorts of um, appraisals, that must make the negotiation with local authorities and actually illustrating that even more difficult. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting topic for the day and we've heard a lot already about, about viability, affordability levels and, and, and rents in general. Um, so I just wanted to really highlight how, from an appraisal perspective, all of those issues come together in, in the viability sense. So, um, as you can see, we've, we've come out with a, with a residual land value hmm. In the order of 13 and a half million. Now that figure on its own doesn't really mean a huge amount in, in viability terms because essentially what we what we want to understand is what we're comparing that to. So in this example, we're saying that the, the benchmark land value essentially, which is predicated on the site's existing use, plus an element of landowner's premium, is in the order of 10 million. So we've actually got a surplus over and above the existing use value essentially. Now, this example um, talks about a 15% provision of affordable housing, which, you know, certainly in, in contrast to London, is, is quite a low level, albeit outside London, it's um, certain areas that, that's more akin to, to, to local policy level. Now, the, the DMR that's, um, that's in this example, um, is it a, a, a sorry, dis discount market rent or affordable private rent, as it's, it's, it's also known. Um, so that's effectively at a 20% discount to market rent. Um, the issue here is that actually um, we can see that with 15% of that provision, we could actually do more. So in other words, that, that three and a half million there is effectively surplus that we can in some way reinvest back into the appraisal. So there's two things that we can do. Well, first, firstly, we can look at the, the overall level. Um, so here we have 15%, we've got 52 DMR units. But actually, if you look at, um, sorry, so if, if, if we switch that up to say 30, 30 percent provision, uh, 35 percent provision, um, and then we see what happens to the surplus, that that shrinks down to 100,000 pounds. So, so essentially, what we're saying is that we're, we're breaking even. We can go, you know, from from uh, 15 percent provision to 35 percent provision, um, and still be viable. Yes. However, when you, look at the, when you look at the actual affordability analysis, you can see that it's really only the smallest units that, that are actually affordable to, um, to, to local income levels. So you can see at the top there, we've got studio units um, and some of the one bedroom units are affordable and that's to incomes of, of um, between 30 and 40,000. However, the larger units, the, the two and three bedroom units aren't actually affordable. <coughs> So then what we can say to ourselves is, OK, well, you know, we've looked at the overall level of provision, but what about affordability? 
So in other words, rather than just simply a 20% discount to market rent, if we were to make those discounts greater and make those units more affordable, what does that do to the, to the viability assessment? So again, starting with our base case of 15% provision, if we then alter the, the actual rental levels, so um, we'll, we'll keep the studios at 80% of market rent, but if we, if we change the one-bedroom units to, say, 70% of market rent, the two-bedroom units to 55%, let's say, and the three-bedroom units to 45% of market rent, you can see that actually the affordability check is a lot more of a positive, um, positive story. So in other words, we're not changing the overall percentage of provision, but what we are doing is we're changing the rental levels, making it more affordable to local income levels. And you can see when we revert back to the surplus, so the, the, the difference, if you like, between the existing use value or benchmark land value and the residual land value of your proposed scheme, we still have an element of, of surplus, uh, 1.2 million left to play with. So at that juncture, we can say to ourselves, well, we know that we've, we've, we've got a more affordable provision of affordable housing, um, but we can actually provide more as well. So if we then look at our overall number and increase from, say, 52 up to 61 units, 63 units even, we're still viable just. So I think there's some really interesting things there just in terms of actually, you know, not just, just thinking in terms of, of a straight discount to market rent, but actually thinking in terms of how affordable are those units. So it's, it's precisely these sorts of issues that we're dealing with on a, on a daily basis. And I think the challenges from our side um, vary tremendously from borough to borough, because what we tend to find is that some local authorities have a very, very clear sense of what they want in terms of affordability, in terms of income levels that are being catered for. Um, and so, some local authorities, you know, it's much more a discussion and a negotiation, which is absolutely fine. However, you know, from our client's perspective, that can be very challenging. Um, you know, particularly at, at the outset of a scheme when, you know, the scheme's trying to be designed and, and time accounted for and so forth. So I think that the, the one sort of thing, uh, the one theme for us is really the greater clarity and transparency around policy and, and around um, local authorities' expectations is, is, is hugely, hugely helpful. So I think in conclusion, having tried to simplify uh, this process, it is just incredibly complicated. Um, I think lack of comparables, lack of transparency, lack of direction on policy just makes life really difficult. And I think it's probably one of the major barriers, um, certainly as I see it, in terms of trying to satisfy that pent up capital that's in the market uh, that is candidly unquestioned at the moment, um, looking for exposure to the sector. So as I say, the intention was to try and make it easier to understand. Um, I hope we haven't made it more complicated, but if you've got any questions, uh, for the panel, then delighted to take them.